M13 is one of my favorites. It's always a nice one to show at star parties. Uh, people get a kick out of it. The, uh, the star cluster is, I believe, the second largest of the star clusters in our sky. Um, Omega Centauri being the largest one uh, down in uh, the constellation Centaurus, which is not visible here from Minnesota, but we can see it from Arizona. Um, M13 reminds me somewhat of uh, uh, either a big octopus or, or maybe a big spider. It's like, here's the body, and it almost looks like it has these arms arcing out of it. Uh, and, and, a, and a tail coming back. That's how I kind of see it is when, when, I, when I see this star cluster and nobody tells me the number, just shows me a picture, it's immediately recognizable because of those, those arm looking um, uh, rows of stars that, that come out of it. Uh, Jim, do you have something to say? Yeah, just a couple quick things. Um... The mystery always was where did these things come from? Because their age is older than the Milky Way, even though they look like they're circling the Milky Way uh, in, around the halo of the Milky Way. And rather recently, within the last decade or so, it's been pretty much determined that there are three sources. One source is it could have been the core of an older galaxy, a small galaxy that was taken over by the Milky Way and it pulled all of the gas away, but these are the old stars that are around the core. And the way you tell that is it turns out that on some of these globular clusters, they have found intermediate mass black holes in the center. And that is a cue that this was a small galaxy. Um, the second thing that's interesting about them is their age is uh, about twice as old as, the, as our sun. So these things are only the medium size and smaller stars, all the bigger ones have gone supernova already that would have been in this cluster. So if you really get a get a spectrographic analysis of some of these stars, you'll actually see they're becoming red giants and nearing the end of their lives, but it'll be more benign. And the third thing is uh, I'm gonna surprise Bernie and ask him if he can put his uh, indicator right about at the one o'clock position on there and see if you can see a shadow. There's a shadow that's got three arms. That's a propeller. That's a very interesting thing to look at in a telescope. When you look at that globular cluster, it's got a propeller right where Bernie's just a little bit to the left. There it is. There's the propeller. That's the Hercules propeller. Sure. Yep, that little, uh, you got one coming straight out on a radial line and then two down below it. It's a three-bladed propeller. Oh, okay. Ah, interesting. I hadn't seen that before. Yeah, and the one uh, going up to the one o'clock position, going up to the upper right is pretty obvious, but the other two are uh, a little more subdued because they're kind of blending yeah. with the light of the cluster. Yeah, when you see it, you usually can see it again, but it take, the trick is to see it the first time. Right, very cool. First time. Yeah, yeah. And so right in the center here, you know, there's a lot of stars we're just not seeing because of the combined light of the cluster. It's just, they're not, we're not seeing the individual stuff. Moving now, it's moving over to the, uh, the next object we're going to look at. And uh, M57 is uh, again, uh, the ring nebula. And the ring nebula is also another one of the uh, uh, the very favorite objects to look at uh, for star parties because uh, it always brings oohs and ahs. Um, the, uh, oh, it's coming in very clearly tonight. It must be straight up. Look at that, Jim. I got two of the, I got the- Yep, two you got them both. Yeah, cool. Yay. Told you I could do it. <laughs> um, nice oxygen ring. Yeah, a good clear, uh, good clear uh, sky tonight. Um, like I say, this has been a long time favorite of a lot of people. Let me see if I can clear that up even better. I'm going to uh, do a little stacking here. Uh, and this stacking is called average stacking. So it's going, not going to make it brighter. It's just going to improve on the image quality. 
by removing some of the noise in the background. Uh, so it's in the process of doing that. Uh, we'll talk about it uh, a little bit. Uh, you'll notice on the ring nebula that uh, there are several different colors involved with the ring. Uh, the outermost uh, color is red. Uh, that is an uh, indication of um, ionized hydrogen um, and uh, some ionized nitrogen, uh, but mostly uh, ionized hydrogen that was blown off as the uh, outer atmosphere of that star uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, you'll also see uh, some blue-green uh, interior uh, of, of the ring, and that is uh, from ionized oxygen. So we know that that star uh, in its interior also had considerable amount of oxygen as well. Now, unlike a supernova where the whole star explodes, um, in this case, uh, when this star exploded, some of it is still there, some of it as a remainder, uh, and you can see uh, the actual star that was the cause uh, of this ring right there in the center. Uh, that's the, uh, the central star. Uh, that star is uh, approximately 15th or 16th magnitude. Now, what that means is it's very, very faint. Um, and you need a fairly sizable telescope to be able to see it visually. Uh, with a camera, you can pull it in. Uh, to be able to see it with a scope, you'd probably need something in the range of, oh, maybe 18 or, or 20, possibly even a 22-inch uh, telescope to be able to see that, that central star. Um, and the very faint one just next to it is probably down in the 17th magnitude, and uh, good luck ever seeing that. Uh, but anyway, um, and I've got one, I've got the two on the, uh, within the ring of, the ring itself, Tim, I yep. pulled it off. You know what? I'm going to save that image. That is uh, probably the best I've ever done with that puppy. I think I'm selling my camera. <laughs> Are ya? Okay. Well, I've been That's trying it. to talk you into, into uh, the DS series for years. <laughs> That's uh, Jim, do you have anything to add about that? Yeah. The um... The reason that the gases are ionized is because those uh, set that central dot that used to be the star is only the carbon and a little bit of oxygen that was left at the end of its life. The hydrogen was making helium. Finally, it just wasn't much hydrogen left, so gravity started to make a collapse. The helium that was made started creating first carbon and then oxygen, and that was the end of the life. That made extra wind, blew all those gases away. So it wasn't really uh, an explosion. It was more of a sneeze. And so those gases went away and left carbon and some of the trapped oxygen behind. Well, the temperature was so high, over a half a million degrees at times, that it uh, most of its energy was coming off as ultraviolet. Ultraviolet light ionizes gases that are that close. That's why you can see the ring. It's because of the heat of those central stars ionizing that gas and making it like a neon sign. Nice, yeah, that's a that's a gorgeous uh, image there. Um, this the Ring Nebula is about fourteen hundred light years away, so um, that's what you're uh, seeing. And the actual star, um, they think, it, um, went through its death throes about six to eight thousand light years, uh, six to eight thousand years ago. By the way, I, I noticed in the database that the ring is growing at the rate of one arc second per hundred years. Huh. Now, that is very, very small, but perceptible uh, change in the growth of the ring. And images of this that were taken, um, maybe not a hundred years ago, yeah, they could have done it a hundred years ago, um, but certainly images that were taken 50, 60, 70 years ago um, in comparison to images that are taken now actually show that slight growth. That's interesting. You can see it in just that short a period of time. 
So what, what you could say is that we've been talking about light years and one light year is six trillion miles. So you can imagine how far away that really is. At, and what happens is that thing is expanding outward at about 17,000 kilometers an hour. And it takes a long time to give enough distance to actually see that change, almost a hundred years to see the shape change. So that uh, it's a remarkable picture for that distance away. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna show you where that is in the sky. So again, before we were looking at uh, Vega, this is the constellation of Lyra, and we were looking at uh, the double-double right down here. Well, the other end of the constellation down here where these other two bright stars are, um, just about uh, halfway between them, maybe not quite halfway between them along that line is where the Ring Nebula is. So it's kind of right along that line in between the, uh, the two stars in the constellation of Lyra. So that's, uh, and that's kind of looking again, almost straight up right now. Now oh, we've got a swan. See, here's the, here's the here's the water. Not perfectly flat, but here here's the water line. Here's the swan's body. Uh, here's the swan's neck, and, and this would be the swan's head uh, back over here. So there's our swan swimming in in the lake of this of the sky. Jim. Yeah. The um... The, the reason that the uh, gas is ionized is because there's about six to 800 stars you can't see that are very, very bright. They're, the thing that makes the swan's neck is actually a dark nebula. It's actually a lot of dust, and the brightest stars in the swan are behind that dust. And the only way you can see them is with an infrared. Uh, right, in an infrared camera. And those those uh, stars that are behind there are putting out so much energy, it's ionizing the hydrogen gas in that field around them. So it's kind of interesting that the thing you can't see is what's causing all the good stuff <laughs> that, that you see over there. And you can tell that when you get, as Bernie has as, uh, zoomed in a little bit, it's shedding a lot of feathers around there all around the place. Yeah, it's a, I always thought this was the the swan swimming so fast it was leaving a wake effect. It could be. <laughs> but yeah. this is really, it can, it's a, a dispersed nebula and it's also called an emission nebula because it's giving off that hydrogen beta um, is the red, uh, the beta form of hydrogen is coming out at us. It's the red ionization. Yeah, it's a gorgeous one to look at, uh, especially in uh, cameras. Some beautiful colors. Okay, so we're going to stay on with Bernie again on this one, and he's going to show you the movement from M17. We're going to go over to M20, which is called the Triffid Nebula. So it's going to be another nebula not too far away. All right. So I'm going to uh, drop my exposure down to five seconds and zoom back out again. And now uh, we're going over to the mount and telescope control software and telling it to find and move over to M20. And we're on our way. So you're going to see those streaks in the image again, like you did before, uh, as the as the uh, telescope and camera um, move over to that object. And very faintly in the center there, you can probably start to make it out. Um, so I will need to do a much longer exposure probably try about 20 seconds. So I'm going to quadruple the exposure time uh, to see if that brightens up a little bit. It's just uh, just noticeable right about here. You can see portions of it starting to show up. 
So this should help a lot. For these kinds of bodies of extent, you can't press the magnitude because when they give you magnitude, that means the integrated magnitude or the sum of all the light across it. So when you get a big cloud like this beautiful object, it's really got low surface brightness and that's what your eye sees. So if, if it says it's a magnitude five and you go to think and you can see it with your naked eye, if it's not a star, you're not gonna see it because it's it's diffuse. I, I increased my exposure to 30 seconds. I think that'll help. Um, so we'll try a little bit longer of an exposure here. Yeah, it's actually showing up pretty nicely. Yeah, it is. It's starting to really come in, especially the dark nebula really sp splits it up nicely. There we go. That's better. There we go. Now yeah. we can make it up. It's getting um, crisp. M20 is called the, the Trifid Nebula. And for good read, uh, some people call it the Trifid Nebula, meaning tri or three. And the reason for that is because this nebula shows the three main types of nebulosity. Uh, you have emission nebula, which is the, the reddish ionization areas. Uh, the blue, which is, which is reflection nebula, uh, it's reflected blue light from hot blue stars in that area. And then you have dark nebula, that's the, the dark bands that are uh, bisecting and trisecting uh, the, uh, uh, the the red section of the nebula. And I think I see a little bit of, uh, yeah, you can see a little bit of these cones uh, of, uh, uh, of gas in the, uh, uh, the nebulosity as well. Right, yeah. uh, Jim, did you have something? Uh, I don't have much more on this one. Um, the, uh, the stars you see that are being made kind of within or born within the nebula are probably fairly young there only about 300,000 light years um, old. Uh, and so, and, and I'll show you here in a minute where it's at. Um, Jim O'Connor, do you have anything you wanna add on it? Yeah, just briefly, uh, this is in an area of the sky that's very rich and good things is we're looking right into the Milky Way. And as a result of this being a rich area, um, if you look at that teapot that we, we looked at earlier, Sagittarius, look right over the spout of it, and you'll be actually looking at the dead center core of our galaxy. So the Andromeda galaxy is, uh, of course, the closest, largest galaxy to us at two and a half million light years. Um, and because it's as close as it is, it, the image of it is actually about five uh, degrees of arc, which is about 10 times larger than the, than the full moon. That's how big it is in the sky. So when you try to image it, it's hard to make it fit within uh, the image field uh, of the camera. And this is about as, about as much of it as I can fit in. Uh, here's the central core. That's where probably 50% or more of the stars of the Andromeda galaxy reside. And then spiraling around the central core, and you can see the spiral arms. Uh, with, this is a dust lane in between two of the spiral arms. So here's one arm here, and then there's another arm here, and they spiral around. You can see them kind of curving around this way and then coming back again. So it's a big spiral pattern in the sky. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the galaxy also has a couple of uh, small uh, dwarf galaxies that um, uh, buzz around it. I don't see either one of them in this field, uh -huh. so they must, be, they must be just outside of the field yeah. of view, unfortunately. But um, 
typically you see the other ones as well. Um, you know, they're outside of the field of view. Uh, but we've got the spiral arms, and that's that's really the the most interesting part of the galaxy itself. Yeah, and you can really see the the core. You know, I mean, and like I was talking about earlier, the core. Um, probably a third to maybe even half the stars in the galaxy or reside in the core. So, um, and inside the center of that core is a supermassive black hole. That's that's a, that's where the the black hole resides, and it's it combined with some other factors is uh, helping keep that galaxy uh, together. So that is Andromeda. Um, it's actually a difficult object to see in an eyepiece on a telescope because typically a telescope will, uh, because of its magnification, uh, will only show you the center core of it. And it can be rather disappointing to look at because it just looks like a big, a big buzz ball. Uh, to see it well, you need a really, really wide field uh, optical system. And the best thing that I've ever seen it with, other than with an imaging camera, visually, is to actually have a very big set of binoculars um, that uh, have a, uh, like a five degree field of view. Uh, yeah. Then it's much nicer to look 